Right. So on this particular topic now, we we'll focus on the larynx. We are still discussing the respiratory system. So the larynx, or what we can call the voice box. This is a structure of the respiratory system where division between the upper and the lower respiratory tract occurs. In terms of position, the larynx can be found between the following cervical vertebrae, between fourth cervical vertebrae and the fifth cervical vertebrae. Okay, so that is the level at which the larynx can be found. So this is the superior part of the larynx, and this is the inferior part of the larynx here. So the larynx superiorly is the thyroid cartilage here. Then inferiorly is a cricoid cartilage shown here. The two cartilages are held by membranes. Now these membranes are referred to as ligaments. But ligaments mainly we use it strictly between bone and bone not between cartilage, but nevertheless, it's considered as a membrane also, as a cartilage. So we call this as cricothyroid cartilage, cricothyroid cartilage, this cartilage in between. The mid part of this membrane is thickened and therefore is known as cricothyroid cartilage. The lateral parts are thin, so they are called cricothyroid membranes. So there's that interchangeable use of the, those two terminologies. It is a mid part that is thickened. That's the one which is referred to as a ligament. Then the remainder of which covers the lateral parts is referred to as a membrane. Nevertheless, it's just a membrane covering these two. So there's a giant space here, which is palpable even in living subjects. You can identify this space here. If you run your finger just below, the Adam's apple. So this is the Adam's apple here. You can feel a notch. This is known as thyroid notch. This one here. It's a notch of the thyroid cartilage. You can feel it. Especially males where these cartilages are overgrown because of influence of testosterone. If you run the finger down there, you feel a gap. That's where the membrane is. And that's a place where a procedure known as cricothyroidotomy is done. Cricothyroidotomy, more like tracheostomy, but it's between the two cartilages of the larynx. Tracheostomy is in the trachea, but cricothyroidotomy is within the larynx. So in terms of function, the larynx, of course, prevents swallowed material from entering the lower respiratory tract by the presence of another cartilage. Now, the epiglottis is not higher line cartilage, rather it is elastic cartilage. So if you check thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage, these are higher line cartilage, but epiglottis is elastic cartilage. Then just superior to the thyroid cartilage is a bone, C-shaped bone here. This bone is known as hyoid bone. So we all have a bone just under our neck there. It's always at the level of the chin, so it's difficult to feel for the bone. But if you palpate nicely, just above where the neck here is beginning from, you can feel a solid bone there, known as hyoid bone. This bone serves as attachment for muscles that are attached to the tongue also. Next, that the larynx conducts air into the lower respiratory tract. So when air enters in the larynx, it's destined to reach the lower respiratory tract equally Air in the alveoli will pass through the larynx into the external environment, which is the atmosphere. Now, as air is passing through the larynx from the lungs, it causes vibration of the vocal cords, and that causes sound, as we call it, in enabling us to form speech. So it helps to form speech, and therefore called a voice box. Now, we're saying the whole larynx is formed by a framework or the skeleton of cartilage i've already mentioned the two which is 
cricoid and thyroid cartilage. Then I've also mentioned another type of cartilage, which is epiglottis. This is elastic cartilage. At the back, what we are going to see is this continuation at the back and lateral, sorry. By the sides, still, cricoid cartilage continues, thyroid cartilage continues. This is the front. This is the Adam's apple. This is the cricoid cartilage. Then this is the lateral view. This is the back of the larynx. So that is thyroid cartilage, the largest cartilage anyway of the larynx, then followed by thyroid cartilage. Above is epiglottis. Though it's shown blue here, the type of cartilage is not the same. It is elastic cartilage. Then now here we are seeing the larynx from the back. So this is epiglottis, thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage. On superior to the thyroid cartilage, into the cricoid cartilage, there are these two. More like pyramid shaped cartilages, left and right. So we call them as arytenoid cartilages. So arytenoid cartilage, so these are paired left and right. Okay, then in addition to that, we have smaller cartilages on top of the arytenoid cartilage. You call them corniculate cartilage. You see those shape, more like sharp tips of the arytenoid. So they sit on top of the arytenoids. So we call them corniculate cartilage. Then finally, here at the entrance or the glottis, this is a glottis into the larynx. Those are cuneiform cartilages. Now this structure shows the cartilages when skin and membrane, when mu mucosa membrane has been removed. But if the mucosa membranes are present, you will not see the cartilage, you just see their markings. For example, here, we are looking at the larynx from the superior view, from above. So we can tell the mark, the corniculate cartilage. Corniculate cartilage, we are saying those are the ones on top of the arytenoids, the sharp tips. They are shown here. Then we have smaller ones on the opening of the larynx, which we call the grotis. We call them cuneiforms cartilage. So these are cuneiform. So in total, we have these paired cartilages, cuneiform, corniculate, and arytenoid. Those are paired cartilages. Then the unpaired one, because they just surround the, the whole larynx, is the cricoid itself, the thyroid, and the epiglottis. So these form more like a chamber, which we call now the larynx. Now, see that this is epiglottis. So in the epiglottis covers here, what will happen? Let's look at this. The epiglottis is now is covered in membrane, but we know that the core of it at the center there is elastic cartilage. So now what will happen is when swallowing, the tongue pushes back. This is the root of the tongue. That's the tongue. The tongue pushes back, and then the epiglottis covers that opening there because that opening goes into the trachea, what we call the glottis. So this is a glottis opening between the vocal cords. So this will cover all this part and nothing can go in. So what will happen now is when this covers, food will run on the surface here into the esophagus at the back. At the same time, food runs besides here. So it goes up and down like that and sides down into the esophagus. So here now we're seeing the larynx from the back, but the soft tissue have been removed, the membrane. So we are just seeing the cartilage. So the, the epiglottis covers the glottis, which is inside there. Then food will fall on the surface of the epiglottis and also on the sides. At the back here, we have the esophagus. Now, I mentioned that earlier on because I want to explain something. When you compare adult, pharynx, larynx, and babies, there are some variations. Look at where the epiglottis is 
in the adult, then look at the distance with the uvula. This is the uvula, the structure that hangs from the soft palate. It's quite a distance here. And therefore, this enables us to breathe both through the mouth and through the nose. So air can enter here through the nose, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx into the trachea. Or through the mouth, oropharynx, laryngopharynx into the larynx through the trachea. This is okay for adults. But in children, in their early stages, we call them obligate nose breathers. Obligate nose breathers because for them, strictly they have to breathe through the nose because of some variation here, we'll see that the distance between the epiglot, the larynx and the uvula is shorter in these individuals. If you check here, they're almost touching. So for them, at any given time, when it comes to breathing, they have to breathe through the nose. So air must enter here through the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and finally into the laryngopharynx via the larynx into the trachea. So while they are lacking the ability to breathe through the mouth, this enables them to feed and breathe at the same time. So they don't need the mouth to breathe. They just need the nose. So you can see this child suckling from the mother. So the nipple is in the mouth and air is entering through the nose all the way into the pharynx and via the larynx into the trachea. Now, why is it that this child is able to breathe and feed at the same time? It's because when the child is feeding, look at this overlap here. The uvula is overlapping with the epiglottis. So the larynx pushes up. So what will be happening is the epiglottis here remains open. Instead of closing like that, falling down like in adults, it remains open like this. So air will be coming in from the nose direct through here and into the trachea. But food will be passing besides, especially milk, because they're just breastfeeding at this stage. Milk will be passing besides the epiglottis from left and right, then four in this space, and then finally go into the esophagus at the back. And that's why babies are able to feed and breathe at the same time. This epiglottis, there's no need to cover here, to remain open. And then since the two are overlapped, the epiglottis and the uvula, milk cannot go direct like that and then fall into the larynx. No? It will just be passing besides the larynx and go into the esophagus. So with age, you find that that distance equalizes and therefore they gain the ability now to breathe both through the nose and through the mouth and lose that ability to feed while breathing. Okay. So that is about the larynx. Then these spaces I mentioned here, created by the thyroid cartilage here, where food will fall in and then go to the esophagus. We call them the piriform fossa. These are fossa or like depressions. So we call them piriform fossa or depressions. They are quite large. And in babies as well as adults, they can act as areas where foreign bodies can lodge. So a child can swallow something, and before it goes into the esophagus, it remains stuck here in this space called the piriform fossa. It can be a toy, seeds, or anything like that. And those sometimes people wish to traffic certain things may actually even hide some of those precious stones or anything in these spaces in the neck. And you may think maybe someone has a tumor or some swelling in the neck when actually they've just hidden something in this space here. So it will stay here. It will not go into the larynx, neither will it go into the esophagus. Piriform fossa. Okay, so again, we are looking at the superior view of the larynx, like that, okay. 
Now we are saying at the level of the larynx, inside the larynx there, it will take you back to this one. This is the larynx beginning from here, going in down. Then this is a bone I mentioned, the hyoid bone, the one that sits on top of the larynx. So if you measure from here up to down there, this is more like halfway. And halfway is where we find the vocal cords. And I mentioned last time that when you're dividing the respiratory system into upper and lower based on anatomy, the division occurs at the level of the vocal cords here. So going up is upper respiratory tract. And then infection from here going up, we consider it as upper respiratory tract infection. From here going down, that is lower respiratory tract and infections in such, we call them lower respiratory tract infections. So if you observe, this is the vocal cord, but there's that gap there, more like a space. Okay. All right, so let me take you back to a better view. Okay. Uh, I don't have it actually. Okay. All right. So we're saying the this structure here, uh, I've lost my here. <laughs> yeah. This is the level of the vocal cords going up. Below, below is the lower respiratory tract. Now that space we are seeing there is called the ventricle. Not same spelling with the ventricles of the heart. So these are ventricles, but there's no blood there. What is there is a space and allows resonance of voice. So it has been determined to say ventricles here in the larynx in male subjects are larger than ventricles in female subjects. First of all, the larynx is larger in males than females. Then the ventricles are also larger. So even among men, again, you find that this, the ventricles can be of different size. There are those that have larger ones, those that have smaller ones. So the larger the ventricle there, that space we are seeing, the greater the the voice, those individuals that have deeper voices is because of the size of the ventricles within the larynx. So that acts as a chamber for resonance so that the voice becomes deeper. Then we're saying now the space from the ventricle going up, we call it the vestibule, from the epiglottis all the way to the ventricle there, where the ventricle is, we call it the vestibule, laryngo vestibule. Then at the level where the vocal cords are going down, we call it the glottis here. So this opening between the two vocal cords, we call it glottis. Then above the ventricles, we call it vestibule. Now, at the level of the vocal cords here, these are the vocal cords there. Now, let's look at them nicely. These are the vocal cords. So vocal cords, of course, is ligaments there, then surrounded by membrane, which is stratified squamous epithelium. Remember the laryngopharynx as well as oropharynx have similar epithelium. It's non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So the vocal cords here, the ones we call the true vocal cords, are uh, these that allow, they vibrate as air is passing out from the lungs. Then the membrane covering this other part, because we don't want air escaping through other roots, otherwise voice will not be produced. We call them the vocal folds. So these are vocal folds. Then in their medial end, they form vocal cords. So these are the true vocal cords. This, even though it vibrates, it will not produce sound. But these need to produce sound. So they are ligaments then surrounded by some muscle and stratified squamous epithelium. So the muscles here, we call them vocalis muscle. Vocalis muscle allow opening and closure. Opening and closure of the vocal cords. So like here, the muscles have you know, contracted and causing the vocal cords to open. Here, the muscles have relaxed, causing the vocal cords to close. 
So what is opening and closing is a is a glottis. So depending on the degree of closure or degree of opening, different sounds will be produced as these vocal cords vibrate. Okay. So at the back, they are attached to the coniculate, coniculate ligaments here. Coniculate ligaments, then in front, attached to the epiglottis. Coniculate ligament in front, epiglottis, and therefore allow vibration. So at that level, I'll take you back to the previous diagram here. If you cut at this level of the vocal cords, going up is upper respiratory, going down is lower. So you see that even nerves and blood vessels supplying the lower part of the larynx are different from nerves and blood vessels supplying the upper part of the larynx. Okay. And that way, you can now tell, say, these two structures in terms of origin have different origin, but form one structure called the larynx. Okay. So what else can we talk about now? We look about the trachea. So trachea, we're saying it measures about 20 centimeters in adults. It has about five to 20 C-shaped cartilaginous rings. Okay, so the last time I said this measurement is not so accurate because we have certain individuals who are taller, others who are shorter. Okay. The trachea is shown even here. This is cricoid cartilage. This is first tracheal ring, second, third, fourth, going down up to 20 or 15. Then we're saying the trachea now begins from C5 all the way to T5, no, C6 up to T5, C6 up to T5. I, th I said that is the best way of determining the level at which the trachea is found than using this measurement, which is saying 20 to 15. Because we have certain individuals who are tall, and we found that they will be having tracheas that are longer than this, and certain individuals who are short, whose trachea is shorter than that. In terms of epithelium, now, below the vocal cords, the epithelium drastically changes from stratified squamous epithelium non-keratinized to respiratory epithelium which is pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium. And this epithelium was also seen in the nose. Okay, It's epithelium of the respiratory system, and it is adapted to perform functions there. Now, I'm saying these C-shaped rings of cartilage at the back here, that is one, two, three. At the back, they are connected by tracheal's muscle. And they explain to say during intubation, if not done properly, there's likelihood of puncturing of the trachealis muscle and creation of the fistula between the esophagus and the trachea. Okay. So at thoracic vertebrae number five, the trachea splits into left primary and right primary bronchus. So it undergoes some dilatation, and that structure is known as carina, the point where they divide. This part here is known as carina. Okay. So I explained about the trachea in the previous uh, video, so we can refer to that. Now let's look at the bronchial tree. I also explained about the gross anatomy of the lungs. So this time we'll just go inside and see what is there, the bronchial tree. So we are saying this arrangement continues, the cartridge support continues all the way into the lung. So all the bronchus, or let's just say bronchi for plural. So that is the primary bronchus, secondary bronchus, and tertiary bronchus. All of them have hyaline cartridge on their surface as support. And I say it. The tertiary bronchus are the ones that supply the segments of the lungs. We're saying our lungs either have eight segments in each lung or 10 segments in each lung. So you expect the number of tertiary bronchi to be equal to the number of segments that an individual have in their lungs. 
So the moment we cease seeing the cartilaginous ring, then we have entered what we call bronchioles. So bronchioles do not have hyaline cartilage on their surface as support. Like we can see here. So the cartilage disappears. What remains next is just smooth muscle. Even bronchi have smooth muscle, but because of presence of hyaline cartilage, the bronchus or the bronchi remain patent, they remain open. They can't collapse. But bronchioles have the ability to collapse because they lack the cartilaginous support. So be it terminal bronchioles or respiratory bronchioles, both appear more or less the same. So we have the main trunk of terminal bronchioles, then branches of the terminal bronchioles are now the respiratory bronchioles. And we say this is where we divide. Below here is the conduction, is the respiratory tract or the res respiratory portion. Here going up is a conduction portion of the respiratory system. That is if you're using physiological classification of the respiratory system. Okay. Now, these are respiratory bronchioles. So even this one will be respiratory bronchial. Now we see that blood vessels are ever coming closer to the bronchioles until they form capillaries. So arteries, arterioles, all of those will occur as we reach now the alveoli. So respiratory bronchioles further divide to give us alveolar ducts. It is a single alveolar duct that will lead to a single alveolar sac here. So respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, and alveolars. These are the areas where gaseous exchange takes place. So because of those segments, remember we have a log segments. Now those segments are separated from one another. So you see septum. This is a septum that separates one segment from the rest. So here we're looking at one segment. What is in there are hundreds and thousands of alveolar sacs with their ducts and respiratory bronchioles. Now all sacs are surrounded by capillaries. Okay, and these capillaries allow exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the lungs and blood. Okay. So this is a structure showing us the difference between the bronchioles and the bronchus. So these are bronchus or bronchi for plural. They keep dividing primary, secondary, tertiary, then finally we reach bronchioles. So this is a bronchial now. You see that the moment the cartilage ceases, we have bronchioles and two types of bronchial, terminal bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles now. So this is a respiratory bronchial. Now, a respiratory bronchial plus alveolar sacs and alveolar duct form a structure of the lung known as an asinus. So a single lung asinus is composed of the following structures. A respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, and alveolar sacs. So that is a single asinus or asini, if there are many. So in each segment of the lung, we're going to find several asinus. Okay, which is shown here. So these are the respiratory bronchioles, then splitting in, these are terminal bronchioles, splitting into respiratory bronchioles. So it is one, two respiratory bronchioles. Then you see the, the sacs already shown here. So that is an alveolus. Connecting to this alveolus to the respiratory bronchial is alveolar duct, which is shown here. Then at the bottom there now we have sacs, a lot of them as alveolar sacs. It is in these alveoli where we find surfactant. So each and every alveoli will have a fluid known as surfactant. Okay, so this one I explained earlier on, difference between conduction and respiratory zones of the respiratory system. 
Let's look at the bronchi and its respiratory epithelium. So in the bronchi, the respiratory epithelium continues. Remember, respiratory epithelium is pseudostratified columnar epithelium with cilia, not forgetting the goblet cells. So here we still have cartilage in the bronchi, remember? The hyaline cartilage. Epithelium is the same. Ciliated columnar epithelium. They are goblet cells, so they produce mucus there. But we said in the bronchioles, there are no goblet cells. Apart from that, in the submucosa, there are some seromucus glands. So these glands plus goblet cells form the mucus that we find in the bronchi. Then the hyaline cartilage, as usual, is present and smooth muscle. So in terms of ratio, we have more cartilage in bronchi than muscle. Okay, so if the person is having an asthmatic attack, it is the muscles in the bronchioles that are undergoing spasms not the muscles in the bronchi because those muscles even if they undergo spasms they will not close the bronchi the bronchi will still remain functional because they have cartilage then in the bronchioles we're saying there are no glands and no cartilage epithelium has changed now it is simple columnar epithelium or simple cuboid so the cells which were tall this time now the cells are becoming short so in terms of histological feature, it's difficult to tell whether they are columnar or cuboidal. So we call them as short cuboidal epithelium, which we can also refer to as simple columnar epithelium. Goblet cells totally disappear. So there's no mucus being produced in the bronchioles. Smooth muscle, since there is no cartilage, so smooth muscles dominate in the bronchioles, and we're saying patients with asthma, this is where the problem occurs. It's these smooth muscles that are contracting, reducing the lumen. And if the bronchial is constricted, let's go back to this structure here. If spasm is occurring here, meaning all these branches, this one, this one, and any other branches down there will not receive air because the blockage is here. So blockage is not in the terminal part. Blockage is somewhere here. Anything connected to that respiratory, to that terminal bronchial that has undergone muscle spasms will not receive air. The alveoli begin to collapse. And this person is now gasping for air, air hunger, because they're not receiving air as they are supposed to. So that's about the bronchioles. Then we see new cells appearing. They are what we call clara cells. So clara cells are throughout the respiratory epithelium even in the trachea they are clara cells in the bronchus they are clara cell that is primary secondary and tertiary bronchus they all have clara cells what is the function of these cells so these are called exocrine bronchiolar cells so they produce some mucus also in the trachea and the bronchus Okay, but the number of these cells decrease as we go towards the bronchioles and towards the alveoli. So only a few, but in the alveoli, completely absent. Instead, they are replaced by type 2 pneumocytes. Okay, function of color cells, number one is secrete surfactant. So in the trachea, we have surfactant. In the bronchus, we have surfactant. But more importantly, that surfactant is needed much here in the alveoli because these are the structures that undergo collapse if surfactant is not inadequate amounts a condition commonly associated with immaturity respiratory distress syndrome simply because this child has immature surfactant producing cells in the alveoli known as type 2 pneumocytes aside from that Clara cells also perform function of detoxification of any inhaled toxic, you know, gases. Then they are also secreting some form of immunoglobulins that protect the bronchial tree. Then finally, they act as stem cells. So these are cells that will replace any other dying cells of the of, of the respiratory epithelium in the trachea, bronchus and partly the bronchioles. So here is a histological diagram showing us clara cells.
So in terms of shape, they are columnar cells, except they don't have cilia. So it's not easy to identify them. But you can see that the cilia here, cilia there, then here, cilia is missing. So that's where you find the clara cells equally here. Cilia, cilia. These two do not have cilia. So those are clara cells. Okay. Next to clara cells, you have a small granule cells. So small granule cells are endocrine cells. Clara cells, we said, are exocrine cells. They are producing some form of, you know, antibodies, toxic uh, substances that you neutralize toxic substances. But when it comes to small granular cells, their action is different. They are producing what can be referred to as hormones, local hormones. And those hormones will influence the activity of nearby cells. So these are small granule cells. Equally, they don't have cilia. If you see, they are more or less the same. Now, there's a type of lung cancer known as small cell lung carcinoma. It is simply a lung cancer starting from these type of cells. So those cancerous cells are originating from this lineage of cells, not from these or the ciliated cells. And such a cancer is considered to have a very poor prognosis, small cell lung carcinoma because of difficultness in treating and getting rid of such kind of cancer cells, okay? Because of hormonal issues, okay? The cancer is also being influenced by hormones. So maybe treated, the patient comes back with a recurrent and maybe even more aggressive episode of cancer and usually patients die from small cell lung carcinoma, okay? Lastly, look at the bronchi. Uh, the respiratory zone. So I'll take you to this diagram now. Here, so we are saying that is a terminal bronchial. Then down there we have respiratory bronchioles. Now see how blood vessels have come closer to the respiratory zone. Because you have alveoli, alveolar sacs, and <laughs> alveolar ducts and alveolus themselves. All this is for the purposes of gaseous exchange. There we have alveolar sacs surrounded by capillary. Then I was saying this septum here is separating one segment of the lung from the other. Histologically, this is what we are seeing in the alveoli. This is low magnification under a microscope. This is high magnification. So let's use a better image. I think uh, this one here is better. Yeah, we can start with this one. So from here, these are respiratory bronchioles. Going down is a respiratory zone. So we're seeing that blood vessels are coming closer to this structure to allow gaseous exchange. And then we are seeing that epithelium is changing. From the bronchus, it was respiratory epithelium. But in the bronchioles, especially the respiratory bronchioles, it is simply simple columnar. Then as we go down in the alveolar duct and towards the alveolus, it's now simple squamous epithelium. The cells become flat. So we see that here, the cells are flat. So this is what we are seeing now in the alveoli, flat cells. Look at the nucleus, they are flat, flat. So this is one alveolar, that's another alveolar. Then this is the alveolar pore, connecting one alveolar to the next. So what makes the wall of the alveolus are two types of cells. We have type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes. Type 1 pneumocytes are the simple squamous cells. These flat cells. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are flat cells. What these cells are doing there, the function is just to allow movement of gases from these blood vessels. You see that a blood vessel here? Blood vessel, blood vessel, blood vessel. So they're just allowing gaseous exchange. So type 1 pneumocytes are for gaseous exchange, whereas type 2 pneumocytes are there to produce sulfur. Okay, just hold on a bit.
Okay, so we're saying type 1 pneumocytes are for gaseous exchange, whereas type 2 pneumocytes are there to produce surfactant. So they are more like clara cells of the alveoli. But in the bronchus and in the trachea, we have clara cells which are producing surfactant. So we don't have clara cells in the alveoli. Now, within the alveoli also, we have macrophages. If you can see this, macrophage, macrophage. So these cells are called dust cells, dust cells. Similar to the kupfer cells we find in the liver. These cells are there for immune function, is to identify and remove anything that is foreign or dying in the body. So I've mentioned about three types of cells found in the alveoli. Type 1, pneumocytes acting as allowing gaseous exchange between blood vessel and the alveoli, which is here. Type 2 pneumocytes, they are not flat, but cuboidal, these cells here. More like star-shaped. These are star-shaped cells. These are there to produce surfactant to allow the alveoli not to collapse during expiration. Third cell is alveolar macrophage, otherwise known as dust cell which provides immunity in the alveoli. Last but not the least is the respiratory membrane, or what you call the blood-air barrier. So we're taking this image here and magnifying it there, or from this one alveoli to the next, from this alveoli to the next, in between is a blood vessel, blood vessel, blood vessel. So. That blood vessel is here. This alveoli is here. So between the alveolar and the blood vessel is what we call the respiratory membrane or blood air barrier. What forms the structure known as blood air barrier or respiratory membrane are the following three structures. Number one, the type one pneumocyte. Number two, Basement membrane of type 1 pneumocyte and basement membrane of the capillary. This is a capillary here, which is shown here. Capillary, capillary. So the basement membrane of the type 1 pneumocyte and the type 2 and the capillary fuse to form one structure, which is just a basement membrane here. So it's referred to as fused basement membrane. Next is just a capillary wall. So essentially, there are three structures. Alveolar wall made by type 1 pneumocyte, fused ba ma basement membrane of the alveoli and the blood vessel. Then the third is the alveolar, the capillary itself. So in short, oxygen and carbon dioxide to leave the blood vessels and go into the lungs, or oxygen to leave the lungs to go into the blood has to negotiate through these three structures as shown here. Okay. And I think we can end here for today. Again, if there are any concerns or queries, you can still ask me, I'll be able to respond.